This is Colin Selig of Binghamton University. This video lecture is for the course ME273 Statics. And we use the book Statics by R.C. Hibbler. Today we will be covering Chapter 5.5, Free Body Diagrams, 5.6, Equations of Equilibrium, and 5.7, Constraints and Statical Determinacy. After today, you will be able to identify support reactions and draw a free body diagram in 3D and apply the equations of equilibrium in 3D. First, we'll look at some applications. We'll look at the support reactions in three dimensions. We'll do some equations of equilibrium in three dimensions, and then we'll look at some problems. So let's look at some applications first. Uh, ball and socket joints and journal bearings. This is a ball and socket, and this is a journal bearing. Uh, they're often used in mechanical systems. To design these joints and bearings, we need to know the support reactions and the loads. Now here we have uh, an overhang at the entrance of a building. Uh, it's pen connected to the wall at A so that uh, it goes to a point B, which is in the center of the overhang. Um, what if you moved A down here, for instance? What if the architect said, hey, I want to move it down here? Would you want to redesign that link AB? Well, certainly, because it's going to be a greater, much greater force in, a, in that link uh, going from here to here than from there to there. The reason being, we still need the same um, vertical component of the force, but since we're getting close to the x-axis, this force has to keep getting bigger and bigger to maintain that uh, force in the y direction that we need, which is the weight of the overhang. Here's a floor crane that weighs 350 pounds and is supporting this oil drum. Uh, how would you determine the largest oil drum weight that the crane can support without overturning? Well, we use uh, statics and equations of equilibrium. So the first step in solving three-dimensional equi equilibrium problems, uh, just like in the case of 2D, is to draw a free body diagram. But before we can do this, we need to discuss different types of reactions that a can occur at three-dimensional supports. Now the reactive force is in a couple moments acting at various types of supports and connections uh, when the members are viewed in 3D is listed in table 5.2 in your book. It's important to recognize the symbols used to represent each of these supports and to understand clearly how the force and couple moments are developed. So like in the two-dimensional case, a force is developed by a support that restricts the translation of its attached member, and a couple moment is developed when rotation of the attached member is prevented. So here we have four examples of support reactions. Uh, if we're on a smooth surface, uh, prevents motion in this direction, so the force is also in that direction. Uh, here we have a ball and socket, so that's like an arm joint. Uh, it can't support any moments at all, but it can support um, moving in any of the three dimensions. So it has reaction forces, Fx, Fy, and Fc. Now, if you have a single journal bearing, uh, that means that it can rotate freely about that axis. Um, this bearing prevents translation in this direction, in this direction, so you've got those two forces. And it can support moments about the z-axis and uh, the x-axis. Right, if you tried to pick up this, if you try to twist this bearing about the z-axis, it, it wouldn't move. And likewise for the x-axis. Now you have a single hinge, as seen here. It prevents translation in all three directions, so we have forces for those. And since it, the hinge, it, it can't support a moment about this axis, but it can support moments about these two axes. You can imagine trying to spin the hinge about like that, it, it won't move. And likewise, like that, it won't move. So we have those two applied uh, moments. That, that we have those two moments which are support reactions. Now this is very important because it makes solving problems possible. Um, single bearing supports, as you see here, um, the single pin and the single hinge are, sh are shown to resist both couple and moment forces. So let's go back and look at that. Now it should be noted that uh, single bearing supports um, here, the single hinge as well. They're shown to resist both force and couple moment components. However, 
if these supports are used in conjunction with other bearings, pins, and hinges to hold a rigid body in equilibrium, and the supports are properly aligned when connected to the body, then the force reactions at these supports alone are adequate for supporting the body. Uh, in other words, the couple moments become redundant and are not shown in the free body diagram. Now, the reason for this should become clear after we uh, start doing some examples. Let's just take a look at this one here. We have these journal bearings at A, B, and C. You know, typically they can they can support moments, right? About this, the y-axis and the and the, and the z-axis, but we're not showing them here because the other journal bearings provide um, enough support so that there will be no applied moment at A. And this only comes from experience. You just have to study the problems and uh, figure out which moments you can throw away in these three-dimensional problems. Now let's look at this example here. We have a journal bearing at A, applied load there, applied couple moment there, and the cable going from B to C. So the free body diagram, uh, we show the applied moment and the load. The tension in the cable, we know its direction is along the line BC. Now the journal bearing at A, it can support the three reactive forces. Because it prevents translation in all three directions. Uh, it can rotate about you know this axis, going through it like that. But it will resist moments about the Z and the uh, and the X axis. And in this problem right here, we have looks like a, uh, a roller bearing there, a hinge at C. But when we draw the free body diagram, we don't put any moments on either of those two supports because the other constraints in the problem, notably this uh, roller at B, prevent this, this um, piece of wood or whatever from rotating. So there will be no moments at these two positions. And you can see that here, we left off the, uh, the moments. The reason we do that is we have to get rid of some unknowns or else we can't solve the problem. Uh, in, 2D, you can solve for at most four unknowns, and in 3D, you can solve for at most six unknowns. So after you draw the free body diagram, you should always count up how many unknowns you have to see if you can even solve the problem. And if you have more than six, you're gonna to have to get rid of some of them due to other constraints negating those reactions. So the free body diagram of this would be, there's a roller at B, prevents translation in the Z direction, so we just have a Z component. The hinge at C prevents it from moving in all three directions, but we're not going to apply the couple moments there because they're not needed to support the body. So that's shown here, and the journal bearing there, it can just support uh, two reaction forces in the X and Z direction. So let's look at some three-dimensional support reactions. Uh, the first one's a cable. As you might suspect, the force is directed along the cable. Uh, smooth surface support prevents translation in the wider in the z direction, so the force is all in the um, well vertical direction, let's say. And we have a roller; it's very similar to the smooth surface support, it all, and it can prevent motion this way, so the force is also in that direction. Uh, ball and socket; it's like your arm; it can't uh, support any moments, but it can prevent translation in any direction. So we have three forces on that. And the journal bearing, uh, it has four unknowns. Um, the reaction forces in the X and Z directions, you know, it can't move in those two directions. Uh, and it also can, it can support moments about the vertical and the X axis, so we see those there. Those are typically the ones that get removed when you have more unknowns uh, than six. And you can see that note here, the couple moments are generally not applied if the body is supported elsewhere. Now we have a journal bearing, but it has a square shaft. Therefore, it can't rotate about that direction anymore. So we have to add that moment about the y-axis. And again, the couple moments are generally not applied if the body is supported elsewhere. Uh, here we have a thrust bearing, and it prevents, it cannot, now this one means it can't move. It's a thrust bearing. It can take a force in the same direction as the um, rotation of that bearing. So we have to apply, add that force, which is F sub y. And it prevents translation in Z and X as well. And it can support moments about the X and Z axis as well. And again, the couple moments are generally not applied if the body is supported elsewhere. 
Here we see a single smooth pen. There's five unknowns. It prevents translation in all three directions, so we have all three forces. And it can you can ro you can rotate it about this axis, but not the vertical axis or this axis. So we have to add those two couple moments as well. Again, the couple moments are generally not applied if the body is supported elsewhere. Here we have a single hinge. It prevents translation in all three directions, so we have all three reaction forces. And it can rotate about this axis, but it can't rotate about these axes, so we have those two couple moments. Again, we don't usually apply the couple moments if the body is supported elsewhere. And finally, the fixed support. Uh, it prevents translation in all three directions, so all three reactive forces are there. And it uh, can't be rotated about any axis, so therefore the couple moments are there as well. Now, as stated in section 5.1, the conditions for equilibrium of a rigid body subjected to a three-dimensional force system uh, require that both the resultant force and the resultant couple moments acting on the body be equal to zero. So expressed as a vector that is the summation of forces is equal to zero and the summation of moments about any point is equal to zero. Now, summation of forces in the F is the vector sum of all the external forces acting on the body and summation moments about O is the sum of all the couple moments and the moments of all the forces about any point O located either on or off the body. So those are the vector forms of those equations. This is a vector as well. Um, the scalar forms are the ones we're typically going to use. Uh, if all the external forces and couple moments can be expressed in Cartesian uh, vector form, then we can um, say that the summation of forces in the x direction is equal to zero, summation of forces in the y direction is equal to zero, and summation of forces in the z direction is equal to zero. And likewise, the summation of moments about the uh, x-axis has to be equal to zero, summation of moments about the y-axis has to be equal to zero, and summation of moments about the z-axis has to be zero as well. These six scalar equilibrium equations may be used to solve for at most six unknowns shown in the free body diagram. These three equations require the sum of the external force components acting in the x, y, and z directions to be zero, and this equation, these equations rather, require the sum of the moment components about x, y, and z axis be equal to zero as well. So we'll move into section 5.7, constraints and statical determinacy. Now to ensure the equilibrium of a rigid body, it is not only necessary to solve for the reaction, the equations of equilibrium, but this body must also be properly held or constrained by its supports. Some bodies have more supports than are necessary for equilibrium, whereas others may not have enough supports and they may be arranged in a particular manner that could cause the body to move. So let's discuss those cases. First is the case of redundant constraints. Uh, when a body has redundant supports, that is, more supports that are necessary to hold it in equilibrium, it becomes statically indeterminate. It means there's more unknown loadings on the body than the equations of equilibrium uh, allow for their solution. For example, if you see this beam in here, it has redundant constraints, right? Um, B and C don't even have to be there because we have a fixed support here and that can support moments in all directions and forces in all directions. So in this case there would be eight unknowns and we can't solve it using statics. And you see the free body diagram here. Uh, reaction forces at C Y and the, um, the moments about the A axis, A Y, you know, all those. So there's one, two, three, four, five. And since it's a 2D problem, we can only solve for three. So again, it's statically indeterminate. Uh, additional equations that are needed to solve statically indeterminate problems uh, of this type are generally obtained from the deformation conditions at the points of support, and that's beyond the scope of this class. Uh, these equations involve the physical properties of the body, such as studied in subjects dealing with the mechanics of deformation, such as mechanics of materials. And here we see this problem here. We have a journal bearing at A and a fixed support at B. So we have six unknowns at, at, at B and we have two unknowns at A. And so we cannot solve this problem either. I mean, if you take away the support at A, um, 
the object, this pipe, will tend to stay in the same place, you know, neglecting its weight, right? So the constraint at A is redundant. Now, improper constraints. Having the same number of unknown reactive forces as available equations of equilibrium it does not always guarantee that a body will be stable when subjected to a particular loading. For example, let's take a look at this problem right here. We have this beam supported by a pin at A. So it has two reaction forces at A. There's an applied load at B. And then we have a roller at B, and it can only su uh, support a moment in the X direction. So, um, when you can imagine this force is going to be pushing down, it's going to cause a moan about A, so that this, this beam is just going to rotate about A and go down like that. So it's improperly constrained. So the summation of moments is not equal to zero. And you can see that because if you sum moments about point A, you know, you'll have the vertical component of this point P causing a moment about A, but there's nothing to stop it, right? There's no moment due to this force. So the beam is going to rotate. And look at this example. Here uh, we have a ball and socket joint at A. So it can't support any moments, but it can support the three reactive forces in each direction. We have applied load at P, another ball and socket at P. And so it can only support the three reactive forces and no moments as well. So when you push down on this uh, pipe assembly at B, you're going to get a moment and it's going to cause the pipe you should be able to realize the pipe's just going to swing down right um, in that case the summation of moments about the line between a and b about that axis is not equal to zero right this it, the, if you're going to sum moments about the line between a and b which is legal you can sum moments about any axis you want and they still have to be equal to zero uh, you're going to get a moment due to the supplied load p and so summation of moments about that line AP is not equal to zero, so it again is improperly constrained. Now another way which improper constraints lead to stability occurs when all the reactive forces are parallel. You can see that in this case we have a beam, it's apply, it has a load applied to it, it has a little x component and a y component, but at A and B they have rollers so it can only support forces in the vertical direction, so in this case the summation of forces in the x direction is not equal to zero. And it should be obvious that this thing is just going to start to move uh, to the right. And here's another example. We have a, a bent rod hung from three supports. Since those are cables, um, their support reactions are directed along the cable. So they're all in the uh, Z direction. However, we have an applied load in the X direction. There's no reactive force to uh, make that motion not happen. So the summation of forces in the x direction is not equal to zero in this case. So this is improperly constrained and you should be able to intuit that if you push on this rod when it's hanging from those three uh, cables, it's going to want to tend to move in that direction. So let's do some examples. We have a rod uh, supported by a thrust bearing at A and the cable BC and it's subjected to this 80-pound uh, load and we have the proper dimensions and we have an established coordinate system already. So find the reactions to thrust bearing at A and the cable BC. So we're going to use the uh, XYZ axis as we see here. We're going to draw a free body diagram. We're going to write out the scalar equations and then use those to solve for the unknown forces. So here's the free body diagram of the rod. Now the thrust bearing can support a load in this direction, the uh, Y direction. However, if you look at the problem, all the forces are either in the Z direction or the X direction. So therefore we don't have to put that reactive force uh, in the Y direction for this thrust bearing because there are no forces in the Y direction. So they got rid of one unknown. Uh, now count for unknowns, one, two, three, four, five. We have six equations, we should be able to solve this. Okay, well, let's, uh, which one should we do first? Well, it looks like there's only one force in the x direction, so let's do that first. Summation of forces in the x 
is equal to a sub x, and that's the only one, so therefore a sub x is zero. Uh, let's uh, sum forces in the z direction next. So we'll have uh, a sub z positive. We'll have the uh, reaction in the cable, it's also positive, so it's plus FBC. And then we have the applied load of 80 pounds, so it's minus 80, and that has to equal to zero. So I'm going to sum moments um, about the y-axis first, because that will get rid of all of the reactive forces um, at that point. So let's sum moments about the y-axis. Now this may be confusing to you. <clears throat> in 3D we sum moments about an axis and you may think well in 2D we did it about a point but actually in 2D you were also summing moments about an axis except that the axis was just vertical to the plane of the paper. So now in 3D we're going to do uh, summation of forces about axes. Now the, way, the best way to do that is to imagine yourself. We're going to sum moments about the y-axis. Imagine yourself walk along the y-axis, turn around and peer backwards along that y-axis so that y-axis goes right through your eye. Then you can start to sum moments about that axis and things tend to make sense. Uh, that axis passes through A like I said, so those all go away. And uh, since we're, let's see, so sum moments about y, there's no y component here so we're safe there. So we're only going to have one unknown it looks like FBC. So um, first, let's do the 80-pound force. It is 6 feet away. No, I'm sorry. It's 1.5 feet away from the y-axis. And it wants to tend to rotate um, clockwise, so it's negative. So it would be uh, minus 80 times 1.5. And we have the moment due to FBC about the y-axis. It's 3 feet away, and it tends to want to rotate counterclockwise it's positive so F sub BC uh, times 3 and from this we can solve for uh, FBC is equal to 40 pounds and A sub Z we plug that uh, back into this equation and get A sub Z to be 40 pounds also okay so now let's move on um, here's the free body diagram and now we've substituted 40 pounds in for this unknown so we need to sum moments now. We already did the y-axis. We, we need to sum moments about the x and z-axis. So let's do that. So summation of moments about the x-axis. And again, the way you do that is you walk along the x-axis, turn around, look back, so that axis goes right through your eye, and that's the axis you're summing about. So az and ax don't contribute any moment about that axis. Um, there's an applied moment I mean, it's at this moment, it's a sub x, so moment a sub x. And then we have the moment due to the 80-pound force, and it wants to tend to rotate clockwise, so it's negative. So that would be minus 80, and it's 6 feet away. And the um, cable tension was 40 pounds, is directed up, so that it wants to tend to rotate counterclockwise about the x-axis. So it is positive, so it's plus 40 times 6. The moment about the uh, x-axis. Don't let this A confuse you. Um, it just means that that axis passes through the point A. Um, I just like to tend to just to write it like that. Um, so that comes out to be 240 uh, pound-feet. And it's positive, so it is counterclockwise. And lastly, we'll sum moments about the z-axis. And we have the reaction force. So we have the reaction force at A. I see why that A was there. The A is there because it is the reaction force at point A. So ignore what I said earlier about A. Anyway, um, the reaction force about uh, the z-axis. And what else has something about the z-axis? Uh, nothing, right? These are both parallel to the z-axis, so there's no moment due to those. So the uh, moment, at, the uh, reactive force moment in the z direction is equal to zero. Now here we have a plate. It's uh, 500 pounds. Uh, it's supported by three cables here, here, and here. Uh, it's got an applied load of 200 pounds. 
at the edge it looks like uh, in the center in this direction okay so find the tension in each of the supporting cables so we already have an XYZ system we'll draw a free body diagram we'll write out the scalar equations and use that to solve for the unknowns so here's the free body diagram of the plate uh, all the reactive forces in the cables go along the cables so they're all in the vertical direction that should be a piece of A there and um, we have the weight of the plate. Now, I said it was a uniform plate, so therefore its center of gravity is at its center. So we have 500 pounds applied, you know, one and a half feet from there and two feet here. And we have the applied load of 200 pounds operating there. So first, uh, everything's happening in the Z direction, so let's sum forces in the Z direction see what happens. So we have T sub B plus T sub A plus T sub C minus 500 minus 200 is equal to zero. Now, no, no need to sum moments about the Z axis because there are no moments about the Z axis. Uh, all the forces are parallel to the Z axis, so they can't uh, apply a moment about the Z axis. So uh, let's sum moments about the X axis first. So we're someone wants up the X, so you walk back, you're looking along this axis, so you see this T sub A, it wants to rotate um, counterclockwise and it's three feet away, so it's three times T sub A. And now T sub C, um, it also wants to rotate counterclockwise about the X axis, and so it's positive, and again, it's also three feet away, so it's plus three times T sub C. Now T B, T sub B, it passes through the x-axis so no moment due to that let's do the moment due to the weight 500 pounds it wants to rotate clockwise about the x-axis so it's negative so minus 500 and its moment arm is 1.5 feet lastly the 200 pound it also wants to rotate counterclockwise so it's neg uh, clockwise so it's negative and it is three feet away so times three and that has to equal to zero and then we'll sum moments about the y-axis. <clears throat> so it's this axis here. Um, so we're looking down that axis. T sub A doesn't apply a moment. It passes through the axis. T sub B does have a moment about that axis and it wants to rotate it uh, counterclockwise. So that is minus T sub B. And its moment arm is 2 plus 2 or 4 feet. 4 feet. And T sub C, uh, it's very similar to T sub B. It wants to rotate counterclockwise, so it's negative. And it's also four feet away, so it's times four. Now the weight, the 500 pound, it wants to rotate um, counterclockwise about the y-axis, right? So it is positive, positive 500 times its moment arm, which is two feet. And lastly, the 200 pound applied load, uh, it wants to rotate counterclockwise about the y-axis so it's positive so that's plus 200 and it's two feet away and that has to equal to zero and you have three equations three unknowns and you can solve for them you get uh, t sub a is equal to 350 pounds uh, t sub b is equal to 250 pounds and t sub c is equal to 100 pounds I use this hash mark sometimes like that, and that's, that means pound. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll do like two, uh, two feet and two inches. Those are kind of shortcuts. Okay, let's look at another one. We have a bent rod. It's supported by smooth journal bearings at A, B, and C. Um, there's an applied load of uh, 800 newtons, and we're giving the uh, the angles, we're gonna to have to use that proje uh, projection technique. Remember, we break up the F, first we break into the Z component, and then we get a vector line in the XY plane as it's, uh, and then we can break that force up into X and Y components. So here's the free body diagram. Note that none of the journal bearings have any moments associated with them. That's because this system doesn't require that. It's, it's constrained enough so that there are no um, moments necessary to support it. So at A we have, this is a bearing so it can't support moments this way, but 
it I mean forces that way, but it can supply it can uh, have forces a x and a and uh, a z. Likewise at B, we've got a couple reaction forces there, and likewise at C, we've got some reaction forces there. So we need to break up this uh, force uh, F, which is 800 newtons, uh, into its X, Y, Z components. So um, the Z component of that force is its magnitude, which is 800 times uh, the sine of 60. If you don't know what I'm doing here, you should go back and review uh, earlier sex chapters, earlier lectures where I talk about how to break up uh, vectors into Cartesian form. So that S of Z, that vector goes you know, this way, so it's negative. And that's equal to 692.8 Newtons. And now we have that F prime vector. It's lying in the XY plane. And that is equal to uh, 800. Its magnitude is 800 times um, cosine of 60, or 400. We want to break that vector into its x and y components. It's 30 degrees from the positive x-axis, first quadrant. So f sub x uh, is equal to this 400, the f prime magnitude, times the uh, cosine of 30. And that equals 346.4 newtons. And lastly, f sub y uh, is equal to that f prime vector magnitude 400 times sine of 30. That equals 200 newtons. OK, so now we've got our uh, applied force vector in Cartesian form. OK, so recall that we just uh, solved for the uh, Cartesian components of uh, the applied force F. And now we'll apply the scalar equations of equilibrium. We'll just start off on the x-axis. Summation of forces in the x, and that is uh, a sub x, and that's positive. There's nothing at b, and there's positive c sub x. And there is the x component of the applied load, and it's positive 346.4. And that has to equal to zero. Some forces in the y, the y component of the applied load, 200, it's positive. And then we have uh, the reaction forces at by and cy, it's equal to zero. And summation of forces in the z direction, we've got a sub z, it's positive. We've got b sub z, it's positive. Nothing at c, but we the component of f. Uh, in the z direction was uh, minus, this should be a minus, uh, 692.8. So we're just going to chug it along here. Now we're going to start some of the moments about the x-axis. So remember, put yourself here on the x-axis. So it goes right through your eye. So az, ax, don't apply a moment. We'll have a moment due to the heart of the... Um, vertical component of F, and we'll have moment due to B sub Z, and we'll have lots of them. So let's just get moving. So C sub Y, let's do that one first. Or some moments about the X direction, it tends to want to rotate counterclockwise, so it's negative C sub Y, and it's um, two meters away. And we have uh, this moment due to B sub Z, it wants to rotate it Clock, counterclockwise about the x-axis, so it's positive, so it's plus uh, b sub z, and it's two meters away. And lastly, we have the um, vertical component of the of the force F, which is this, and it tends to want to rotate it uh, clockwise, so it's negative as well, so it's minus six ninety two point eight times uh, this one, two meters. And all that has to equal to zero. The x component of this force is parallel to the x-axis, so it doesn't have a moment. Uh, the y component of that force passes through the x-axis, so it doesn't have a moment. So summation moments about the y-axis, which is this one. So it passes through F, passes through A, so we don't have to worry about any of that. Um, Looks like this BZ is going to tend to rotate uh, counterclockwise, so that would be positive B sub Z uh, times one meter. 
one meter away. And then we have the uh, X component of the reaction force at C. Uh, it's going to want to tend to rotate it positive, so it's plus uh, C sub X. And it is um, 2 meters. That equals 0. Okay, that should be an equal sign. All right, so now lastly, we'll some moments about the z-axis. So now we're here, we're looking down, nothing at A. Um, the z component of F doesn't, it's parallel to z. The x component will, the y component won't because it goes through A. So we need to account for the uh, x component of the applied force F. So that would be, you know, it wants to rotate, it's in this direction, so it wants to rotate uh, clockwise around, so it's negative. So it would be uh, minus 346.4, and it is uh, two meters away. And we have a um, moment due to C sub X, right? It wants to rotate clockwise as well. It's two meters away, so it's minus C sub X times two. We have uh, at B, BY um, has a moment about the z-axis. It's one meter away, wants to rotate it kind of clockwise, clockwise, so it's minus BY times one. We left one out. C sub Y, of course. C sub Y has a moment about the z-axis. Uh, it tends to want to rotate clockwise about the z, so it's negative. So it's minus C sub Y and it is one plus it's 1.75 meters away and that has to equal to zero so a mass algebraically got to solve for those unknowns i'll leave that to you uh, so a sub x comes out to be minus 400 newtons a sub z comes out to be 800 newtons B sub Y comes out to be 600 Newtons. B sub Z comes out to be minus 107 Newtons. C sub X comes out to be 53.6 Newtons. And lastly, C sub Y is minus 800 Newtons. This concludes the video lecture on sections 5.5, free body diagrams, 5.6, equations of equilibrium and 5.7 constraints and statical determinancy that ends chapter 5 next up is chapter 6 6.1 simple trusses 6.2 the method of joints and 6.3 zero force members see you in cyberspace